And hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I hope everyone's doing okay. Happy Friday night. My name is Fiona Wright. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Carleton University Art Gallery. I'm so happy to uh, welcome you to QEG's first online event, Talking Food, Land, and Relationships. Uh, it was pretty uh, wild, I have to say, to um, be able to see the registrants in advance. Um, and I was really happy to see uh, so many friendly names. Um, so um, I'm sorry that I can't see all your faces, but um, thank you so much for, for joining us and, and spending this, this Friday night with you, with us. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we'll get started. Uh, this panel is organized to accompany They Forgot That We Were Seeds, uh, curated by Kozi Suchukui Nebe and presented at QEG from February 9th to uh, March 15th. This exhibition used food ways to reimagine the history of Canada as a settler colonial state, placing Black and Indigenous women artists at the center of efforts to construct a counter narrative. It featured the work of Casey Adams, Deanna Bowen, Roxana Farrell, Bushra Janaid, Amy Malbuff, Meryl McMaster, Cheyenne Sundance, and Catherine Tekpani. Uh, so today, uh, we're really pleased to welcome Cozy Nebe, uh, three of the artists from the exhibition, and moderator Rochelle Dickinson to this free public discussion. Uh, Casey Adams is a Cree, Ojibwe, and British artist and educator based in Winnipeg. Cheyenne Sundance is the Toronto-based founder of Food Justice-Centered Urban Farm Sundance Harvest. Catherine Takpani is an Ottawa-based Inuk photographer. And, uh, and of course, Cozy Nebe, curator, artist, policy analyst, um, and Rochelle Dickinson, uh, independent curator and scholar, uh, who will be moderating the conversation. Uh, this conversation is generously supported by the Risa Greenberg Digital Initiatives Fund. I'd also like to acknowledge the support of Carleton University, Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, who funded Cozy's curatorship through a culturally diverse curatorial projects grant, and Andrea Fatima, who mentored Cozy throughout. I also want to thank Jason Laguerre, our art education assistant, for all the help putting together this event. So uh, Jason and I will be behind the scenes, uh, moderating the comments and the questions here and um, on Facebook. So I'm um, really looking forward to this conversation um, and I'll pass it on to Cozy who will be doing uh, the lecture. So hi everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Great. So it's a pleasure to be on the panel with so many women I respect tremendously. Um, but before we get into the conversation, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement for today's event. I'm actually on vacation with my family in Segni, so I'd like to first acknowledge that the lands on which I'm currently speaking is a traditional territory of the Innu nations, and more specifically, Pekia Mianaj, who've hunted, fished, and gathered wild fruits throughout this land for millennia. I'd also like to acknowledge the first occupants of the land on which this particular exhibition, They Forgot That We Were Seeds, came to be, Ottawa, which is the, the traditional and ceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence reaches back to time immemorial. I first heard a territory acknowledgement of this kind in university, but have only recently come to understand that the true power of such statements lie in the actions that they're able to inspire. And for me, that action has been a real desire and real intent to make relationships with the first inhabitants of this land and to show through my words and my actions, my respect for them as the customary keepers and defenders, not only of Ottawa, but the entirety of Turtle Island. And because territory, uh, territory acknowledgements require an, an acknowledgement of one's positionality, I'd like to start by sharing a bit more about who I am and why I wanted to curate this exhibition. So I first moved to Canada from Nigeria when I was five and grew up for most of my life in the national capital region, but never really engaged with what it meant to be on this land until I was in my early 20s. My first relationships with Indigenous folks were as a federal official from the time I was around 22. I would go into communities and engage with First Nations, Inuit and Métis folks on food related issues as part of the government's engagement on the development of a national food policy. And throughout this process, I initially saw myself only as an ally, a young black woman trying to make things better. 
But with time, um, I started to realize that I was also being seen in a different way. And that was as a settler and as someone who was complicit in the settler colonial state and who was actually representing the state when going into these communities. And I really had to grapple with that, that knowledge and that acknowledgement of myself as, as being complicit in this project. And instead of turning away from it, I thought I had to dig deeper. I had to better understand what that meant. I needed to understand the history and the ways in which there have been um, ways in which our, our paths have been separate and parallel, but also have interconnected. And I wanted to do that through art. And I decided that the best way to do that was to bring together eight amazing Black and Indigenous women artists to really explore the past, present, and future kinds of relationships that are, that are possible between both groups, um, the intersections as well, as well as our relationships to the land and to the state. So I don't think I could have chosen better artists for this show, and I'm so grateful to be able to share this space with you again right now. And with that, I'll pass it back to Rochelle. Thank you very much for that, Lizzie. Um, it's, it is an incredible honor for me as well to be invited to moderate this panel. Uh, I admire each and every one of you who work, those on the panel, as well as the rest of the artists in the show and uh, Cozy's Pure Trail Vision. Um, to follow on what Cozy said, uh, uh, it's important to me to locate myself as well, and very briefly I'll say that I identify as, that's Jack, <laughs> right there. Um, <laughs> that I identify as uh, British, Irish, and Red River Métis. My Red River Métis connection is to my paternal grandfather. And I honor all of my ancestors in that way. And uh, as I speak to you, I am on the unceded uh, traditional territory of the Algonquin Nation in Ottawa. Um, because of how I identify and how we move through these politicized spaces that we work and live in and create in, uh, it's important to have this kind of debate and to have these kinds of exhibitions and to have an opportunity just to talk to each other about what it means to work across constructed and uh, reconstructed and um, resourceful uh, relationships and intimacies. Um, so thank you again for inviting me and I will be participating much less after I say a few words about access checks for Greg and our Zoom meeting. So you're invited to add your comments and questions, uh, both in Zoom and on Facebook. We welcome your contributions and we look forward to how they'll add to the conversation. Do please make sure to keep them respectful. You'll be able to up, up, upvote questions, so please do so. Um, the event will be about an hour and a half long. Take time to stretch, stand up, and do whatever you need to do. The conversation is going to be recorded, and, and we'll be adding closed captions, and it'll be posted later on uh, Kuwait Carleton University Art Gallery's YouTube channel. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can just pop in with the chat uh, and let us know. Um, we'll start the, the dialogue predominantly, and we'll be talking with the artists, and they'll be talking with each other and with, with Cozy. Um, one of the things that I'd like to start with, uh, and it's a question to all the artists, is Cozy, uh, in her introduction, mentioned that there's, you know, how, how do we move through the, the separate but parallel connections and, and the relationships that exist through land, across land, and within, within the land of Turtle Island. When we were talking about this, um, this panel in particular, the word intimacies came up a lot. And I'm wondering if each of you can speak about how, how your works in the exhibition demonstrate the kinds of intimacies you feel within your community to, to the land or maybe without into another community. Um, and if I can start with uh, Cheyenne Sundance, that would be great. Thank you. So the question was regarding intimacy and how intimacy works. Um, between my piece and currently with the work I do with my community. Yeah. Um, I would say my piece, Wood, English, Ivy, and Peas, um, does, hold on, let me just, I have what construction's happening, let me just close. Okay, thanks. Do we want to pull up that uh, image of Cheyenne's work? Yeah, let's pull up that image. Um, so I'm just going to Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I would say the intimacy of my piece is also how um, everything is rooted close together. 
Uh, so when, when you're seeing when uh, the English uh, ivy is growing along the pea shoots and the roots of the both plants are cemented in the soil, um, that also speaks upon a certain type of intimacy, um, intimacy of sharing the same medium, the same growing space. I would say the ways that my piece is also reflected in my community regarding intimacy is I do feel like, and from what I've seen, um, that forging new relationships with the land or existing relationships with the land is a very intimate thing. There's something to be said about being able to have time with the land by yourself as well and find yourself within that space. And I feel like when I made this piece, I was really feeling that. I, I was feeling a lot when I made this piece. I was going through a lot of transitions in my life. And to be able to not manipulate, so to speak, but have a role in the way a living thing survives and thrives was very special to me. And I see that same intimacy of having a relationship with the land and in some way being a part of the land's um, story um, in this way in my own community as I grow food. But beyond just growing food, I also uh, do um, restor restoring native um, species of plants along ravines. So doing that as well and like understanding that having a relationship with the land in more of a reciprocal way, less of a farming way where you're literally taking things out um, is a very interesting thing. So I think that's what I would say, the intimacy piece. Um, I do, I do, yeah, I think that's what I would say. What do you think, sorry, one quick question there, Cheyenne. What do you think, how does it translate in the gallery? What, what do you think it brings into a gallery installation? The piece? Yeah. I think what it brings into the gallery is something that's very living. I think it was very cool that it was just consistently alive and growing and and overall like changing. And the interesting thing about having living pieces from day one to day two even, it doesn't look the same. Even if we can't notice it as um, non-plant beings, the plant's life itself and the fungi and the soil, and I know it because that's my compost, um, has a <laughs> life, right? And every day it changes in some way. So I feel like the intimacy pieces, people are witnessing the plants and the soil and the fungi changing itself. And they're involved in the process because they breathe in the oxygen and the plants, you know, releases also like carbon dioxide. And like that also is a type of exchange and intimacy if you're around the plants. So I would say, yeah, that's what I would say. It's a really interesting intervention into the gallery space. Um, Casey, did you want to respond to the question regarding the relationship between intimacies and community land in your practice? Sure. Tanse, Totimak, Kapapama Pimanat, Mikasu Esquayo, Nitisin Nikasson, Ni Mama, Judy Adams, Iste Geso, Ochikeo Isi, P, Ni Itutimak. What I said what is in Cree, my name is Flying Overhead in Eagle, Flying Overhead Eagle Woman. Um, and I said hello to all my relations. And uh, I said that I come from Judy Adams who is originally from Fisher River. Uh, the important the reason why every time I introduce myself um, in these kind of situations is that it's important to know where you come from so that you know where you're going. And so I like to acknowledge my mother, uh, an elder told me that that's important. So um, that's my introduction. Uh, so when I, when I think about the, the pieces that I created, for this show, um, I can honestly say that uh, the vessels working with clay uh, changed my relationship, not only with my community, but also changed my relationship to land and water. So if, if, um, if my installation image could be pulled up. And can you hear me properly? Yeah, okay, okay, that's good. So, so these are um, clay vessels that I created within the space. What I had done was I had brought um, clay that I had harvested from the land and um, the shapes and forms are inspired by uh, ancestral uh, vessels that, uh, that have been found all around Manitoba. And it's a lost art um 
not not many people know how to do it. In fact, a lot of the knowledge that I got was from archaeologists and anthropologists. And so, uh, but when I touched the clay and I started creating these vessels, uh, it was like blood memory kicked in and it felt familiar. And so it, it, it was um, being able to collect clay from the land, use water that um, I harvested, mixing it together and then also by using a temper uh it's usually something that you add in like sand uh the temper that i would use would be um granite from sweat from um, sweats and they break down and basically it's easy to crush them and you mix it in with the clay so that it can handle um the high heat that's required for for cooking so what that did was it completely altered the way I thought about indigenous pottery, but it also changed, created an intimacy towards the land and water that I never had before. So it was an important process that I had gone through. Can you talk a little bit about um, the legacy photographs as well in that way because it's a different kind of approach to photography as well as it was done a few years ago right, right. yeah so these these photographs were actually um what i wanted to do was i had read read an article um through the world health organization that talked about how indigenous people around the world have uh 50 percent have type 2 diabetes so 50% of the indigenous population around the world, this was back in 2010, um, have type two diabetes. Um, at the time my mother did. And so what I was doing residency in Australia. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to address that, that discussion. And uh, what I did was I took photographs of indigenous um, elders from Samoa, from Australia and from New Zealand and I took pictures of body parts that are affected by, um, by these foods, basically. Um, and the different body parts are, are parts that are affected by diabetes. So you can see the fingertips. Those are toes at the bottom. And these all become problematic uh, when you're a diabetic, your eyesight. Um, what I like about this one is at the bottom, she has a tattoo um, that's on her wrist, just like mine. And um, I wanted to acknowledge that this is very problematic, the foods that we are, um, that have been introduced to us. But I also wanted to highlight the strength and the resilience of the people. So I didn't want it to be um, completely uh, thinking of it as a tragedy. I wanted to show it as a source of strength and resilience. Thank you for that. Um, Catherine, did you want to answer the question about intimacies in your practice, mm -hmm. again, a, a photographic practice and an interesting context too for your, for one of your pieces in the show? Um, hi, um, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Okay, Thanks. awesome. Um, I wanted to share that I was overwhelmed. Um, there was a woman named Berna who opened our gathering and my pieces um, in this exhibit are images captured throughout the entire um, evening. Um, we started with with Berna, who, who did a ceremony, and we were able to showcase uh, one by one um, our vulnerabilities, our shared realities, our histories, everything that brought us together, um, thanks to Kosi. And I was kind of almost a fly in the wall. I did, I did participate and I did share, um, but I wanted to capture the into of the entire night um, by, by being present, but by also not being present at the same time. I, I wanted to capture, um, like for instance, with the kudlik, 
um, there's a lot of tender care um, with Inuit culture um, involving the kudlik um, with the, with the light. Oh, yeah. um, there there was uh, two two images um, with the kudlik involved, and it's it's important to Inuit culture how we ended up thriving, how we ended up coming to be, and how um, it it brought um, the ceremony and and the intimacy of the night um, together. I I just wanted to say that it it was amazing to be a part of it and to capture all these moments of of all of our shared histories and realities past and and future how this conversation how we all came to be how we all spoke about ourselves and and what we wanted to see um, for the future i really just wanted to capture the the care and detail of everything that was put into this, all the different food, all the different people, all the different shared ideas, and all, all the shared realities as well. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Did you so, find it, uh, sorry, do you want to jump in, Cozy? No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Um, Catherine, did you find it, uh, like, how did you come from being in the space and documenting it to the aesthetic choices you made in producing the final images? And, and, and how did your experience inform this decision? Ooh. <laughs> oh, it's a really specific this, question. This, um, just to be, uh, there was, I, I think I have actually over like 600 images for the, <laughs> for awesome. the whole um, evening because it, it, was, it was long, it was beautiful. I wanted to capture it like as we were gathering food together. Um, this is an image of Kosi's mother and a young Inuk um, girl. And at that time, she was so shy that <laughs> I, I know that uh, Inuit have a history of seeming, seemingly being very shy, but Kosi's mother was incredibly warm and welcoming and wanted to engage with her and I, I as soon as some of the moments that happened in the night it just it flashed like there there are some smiles there's some teachings there's all of us gathered together in a circle um, the images were actually helped chosen by Kosi um, she she was able to um, we we were able to go back and forth about how we wanted to present the evening how it, it's really hard to in very few images um but <laughs> we we managed to we managed to capture and share a lot of the intimacy that that evening that's incredible <laughs> that actually brings me my next question is for cozy so as the curator, Kosi, did you, can you run down a bit, a bit of the planning, like the, from, from start to finish? So for uh, the broad, exhibition? Yeah, broad strokes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so <laughs> the planning for the exhibition. So it was actually a friend of mine that encouraged me to reach out to Heather. Um, Anderson, who's a curator at QAG, and just to submit a proposal. And from there, I had been, I was still working at Agriculture and Agri Food Canada, so working on the development of that food policy. And those questions were very much top of mind. I was struggling with my role, um, starting to feel as though I might be, might not be um, the ally that I thought I was. So I went in with very good intentions, and all of a sudden, I'm starting to feel as though I might be the problem. And I didn't know what to do with that. And I still had to go into work. Um, and I just didn't know how to address this for my job. And I thought, okay, maybe this is an opportunity to address all of those questions, those issues through my art practice. And I just felt as though I couldn't do that by myself. So for me, the, the next best thing, or the best thing actually, was to really be a curator of an exhibition that was able to harness 
the beautiful talent of all these other artists who could tell these stories, who had been telling these stories, right? So Casey's work, um, she did the installation for the first time a couple years before this next iteration as part of the show. Bushra's work had been part of an exhibition that she had curated um, alongside Roxana. So when I was starting to plan the exhibition, I was able to look at, at works that had already been exhibited, that already existed, that spoke to the scenes that I was trying to kind of speak to. Um, so Bushra's exhibition, Newfoundlands, was beautiful and it was actually a starting point for me in terms of understanding what she was she was doing, um, interrogating the connections between the Caribbean and Newfoundland, and then trying to, uh, basically not trying to, but actually really emphasizing the connections to blackness. Um, and what I wanted to do was to continue that conversation and start to understand the ways in which, you know, we talked about parallel kind of stories or parallel paths, um, the ways in which they interconnect. And for me, it was starting to question, you know, I understand that cod being fished off of the coast, uh, off of the East Coast would then be shipped to the Caribbean and then would actually um, be used to kind of sustain these populations of enslaved Africans because it was the chief source of protein. But after that, what happened, right? And you have these ships that are coming back from the Caribbean with sugar and its derivative products, right? Um, molasses and rum and so on. And what you have uh, is then a conversation as to what happens when those foodstuffs are brought back to Turtle Island. And that's where that, those stories start to interconnect. Because the, um, those same goods that were produced by Black labor in terms of salt and sugar, they then had devastating effects on Indigenous populations when they were consumed here. So those stories actually are, are telling different sides of the same story of exploitation and oppression and domination. Right. And then you have works like Roxana that speak to these dominant kind of structures and how they're upheld. Um, so I'm not going to go all into all of that because you asked me about planning and I'm getting away from that. Um, but I was able to start. <laughs> I was able to start with works that already existed, exhi exhibitions that already existed, and to then try and fill in the gaps to a certain extent or connect the dots. Um, and that's where Casey's work came in. That's where Amy's work came in. And they really um, just. It's a really beautiful and intricate story about really those connections from um, the East Coast to uh, Newfoundland and sugar and salt and cod and so on. But there's also an extension of that where I was starting to really question again that complicity or the, the complexity of the relationships between Black and Indigenous women or Black and Indigenous peoples writ large. And for me, that really has to do with land, right? To talk about food is to talk about land. And land is a very, very complicated kind of subject to touch on when you're talking about things like Black liberation um, and the Black presence in Canada and also like Indigenous sovereignty because I think there are discussions to be had there, um, not in terms of tension, but in terms of just complexity. So I wanted to delve into that complexity a little bit more. And that's where Meryl's work and Deanna's work is are, work so well together. And I knew both of them separately. Um, I had always wanted to work with them and really saw complementarity in their pieces, which are both kind of located in the prairies. Um, with Meryl speaking to um, the importance of certain landscapes in the prairies to her, her ancestors, and Deanna's work speaking to the migration of her ancestors to the prairies as African American settlers. And the complexity of, of that, of not only being um, of not only being a black woman, but also a woman with uh, indigenous heritage and how there are those those intersections and black indigenous peoples do exist as well. And that, uh, again, is that complexity. Um, so that's where that came in. Uh, those two works came in. And then Cheyenne and Catherine, I just really wanted to work with both of them because of the ability to speak really to relationships. Um, so Catherine's work, we, in terms of intimacy, I think like we worked so closely together on that piece, on, you know, organizing, talking about the event, and I really did feel that intimacy as we were working together, and I think that's what you see with those photos, and I'd love to, I'd love to come back at some point to the actual dinner, because that was such an important moment for me, um, but really starting to look at the kinds of relationships that are possible in the present, and really starting to reconfigure them, or see what else is possible, because it was in sharp contrast to the kinds of dinners or kinds of, of interactions I had as a federal official, where there was so much mistrust and I wasn't able to develop um, those kinds of intimate relationships. And I had to take a step back and really start to engage outside of those confines. I still, I'm still struggling to understand how to bring that intimacy in my job as a federal official. Um, so that was really something that I wanted to see there. And then with Cheyenne's work, which, like you said so beautifully, Cheyenne, is very much a living work 
I wanted to really start to think about the future. And I think you can start to see in nature those patterns that really speak to how decolonization, what it would look like for us, right? How we can have Black liberation and Indigenous sovereignty um, and how that could work together and we can support each other mutually. Um, so that's kind of how all that came together. Sorry, that's a lot. No, that was amazing. I just want to ask any of the artists on the panel if they want to respond or have questions or want to speak to the the overarching intent and the, the, the complexity of the exhibition. No? Okay. Casey. Uh, <laughs> I'm Sorry, it's just none of the kids want to raise their hand. <laughs> I know, it's okay, no problem. Um, I'm wondering, and I'm gonna ask each of you the same question. Um, Coming out of uh, Cozy's description of, of the intention of the exhibition, when she approached you to, to be a part of it, why did you decide to do so? Why did you think your work should be part of that dialogue? Uh, are you asking me now? <laughs> I'm asking you, Cozy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, first of all, I was thrilled um, to, to be asked to be part of this because um, you know, this hasn't changed since the first time I, I did this this work. Um, diabetes is still an issue. Food sovereignty is still an issue. Um, there are a lot of, um, I felt like the work was still relevant and still talking about things that we, we need to talk about. Um, the work that, w that I had created um, was for a thesis show. So it was only up for five days. And what I failed to mention earlier was that these clay vessels that I made, I did them in situ and uh, I used, originally I used commercial clay uh, because I didn't know how to harvest clay at that point in time. And I made these raw forms and then I placed the five gifts, which is milk, sugar, salt, lard, and, uh, which one am I? Milk? Did I say milk already? Um, anyways, so the flower, flower, right? So, so what I wanted to do was uh, we actually used real cream, poured it into these vessels, and lard and all of these these uh, gifts that we received from from uh, uh, you know a subtler diet and. Uh, what it did was it broke down the vessels. So uh, at the time that I created this, I was thinking about my mother and um, being able to do it the second time was important because my father now has type two diabetes and he actually lost um, part of his leg. So it became, a, it became an important issue, uh, not just not just for my community, but also for my family. And I really, I've, I had also been learning more about indigenous pottery and learning about this lost art. And the second time around that doing this exhibition, I had all this knowledge that I had accumulated um, since 2010. And I now have a better understanding of, and creating a more, um, intimate relationship with with land and water so i wanted to bring that forward and i was really excited to to be asked to be part of this thank you for that that was great uh it's an interesting dialogue too especially when you start to think about um your work with shining's work and how they're both shifting and changing in the space um catherine do you want to tell us what you thought when you received the invitation and why you thought your work, why you wanted to begin this dialogue in the way that you did with this exhibition? Of course. Um, am I properly unmuted? <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, when Kosi approached me, I was extremely excited to be a part of this. Um, fun fact, um, I wasn't supposed to originally showcase uh, work um, of that evening that that came afterwards um, Kosi and I um, sat down my my son was about 
three or four months at the time. <laughs> and he, he was just so tiny. And uh, we were going to just look over um, different art. I had images of crow ceiling um, because the conversation about land, um, colonialism, um, relationships uh, with Canada, with Indigenous, with Black, how we all have been um, dispersed from our land in different ways, but having similarities. Um, we looked over images of Iqaluit, um, one of the last times I had been back home. Um, and and it, it evolved into me taking images of, um, of the night. But prior to that, when Kosi did um, approach me, I, I thought so much, um, just like Casey Adams had mentioned, um, my, um, my own, uh, Anana or Ananaga, my mom, um, she was a federal, um, school survivor. She also had TB when she was six and was taken from, um, her community in the North brought down to a sanatorium in Toronto and was introduced a new diet. And she also developed type two diabetes. Um, it's actually only within the last two months, um, my, she, she moved back home and her diet is strictly, uh, she's fishing for Arctic char and she's uh, collecting clams and she's berry picking every single day. And since she has gone back home, she actually doesn't have diabetes anymore. Uh, she, she's, she's not um, eating a Western diet, and she's specifically gone back to our, our, our land, our food. Our, um, there, there's a lot of importance to me for the conversation um, with colonialism, with acculturation, uh, what happens um, when you rip or attempt to rip culture from an indigenous group. I, I wanted to be a part of the conversation, not only to learn more, but also to kind of share um, where um, I guess my Inuit story is um, being an Inuk and um, but when it transformed into taking images of the night I I was I was still over thrilled to just be a part of this to be a part of this conversation to be a part of the awareness to to be with everyone and to learn a lot more <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. that that's amazing. Um, Cheyenne, can you speak a little bit um, about, I'm just thinking through what, what Catherine had talked about and uh, watching Casey's face and uh, wondering if you can talk a little bit about why you wanted to participate in the exhibition, this particular exhibition, and and your perspective on the cultural significance of uh, cultural, intellectual, psychological, and emotional significance of your practice, which is land-based. We were talking earlier about how you have a garden, or you have a you have a farm in in a greenhouse, and, and so it's you're coming at this from a really specific perspective, and, and I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Um, so I was interested in this project because when I met Cozy, I remember the coffee shop we went to and I remember how well Cozy and also warmly you articulated your vision. And I've never, I don't know if I would call myself an artist because this is my first art piece I've ever done. Um, but I felt very like invited, which was a very beautiful thing. And I think that the way Cozy curated this piece was so beautiful in a way that you found all these pieces and you put them together in a way that just worked. And I, I felt like when I was thinking about like my piece and the ideas of my piece, um, the fact that it was living, like I mentioned earlier, uh, made me feel very called to do it. Um, 
it made me also see art as someone who's doing it for the first time in a way that um, is kind of boundless in a way that could be a lot of things and that is a lot of things, uh, which was very fun for me. And I think the whole experience was of me dipping my toe in, but also being able to kind of form that pond I would dip my toe in. And that was a very interesting um, thing for me to experience. So I think that's why I was interested because the way Cozy framed it um, in such a beautiful light. Um, and I think that the piece um, I have in my work, the significance it has on like, I guess my new art practice and a bunch of other things um, is that most of my days I'm growing food and teaching my community for free and starting up many farms. Um, my farm has four locations and hopefully another one next year on a rooftop, which is a fairly large scale. Um, but also seeing how things and plants and food can survive and thrive in an urban setting was very interesting to me. Um, many of my friends who are Black and Indigenous who are displaced here in Toronto um, still have a relationship with food and land. So figuring out a way to make space and take up space with Sundance Harvest has been really fun and really beautiful, but also very hard. So I feel like my my practice and my piece relates to um, me continuously taking up space um, regarding growing food and being able to um, respect and form a longer relationship with the land. So I would say it has that significance. Um, I do think going forward, I'm probably going to stick to living mediums. I feel like that was a very exciting and fun experience. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say. Thank you very much for that, Cheyenne. It, it raises another question uh, from what you've described. I'm wondering how, from all of you, including Kosi, how um, the relationships between land, food, Black and Indigenous women, how, how can they influence the ways that we understand where our feet rest? and then the political climate within which like that surrounds us. So uh, is, that, is that clear? Is that question clear? A little bit? Okay, I'll try again. It's a really big question in my head. I'm trying to make it like, you know, bite size. Um, the relationships that you talked about, Cheyenne, um, but particularly because this is your first installation piece and you, you have uh, an experience by the sounds of it, an extensive practice that is urban land-based as a Black Indigenous woman, that, that that provides or that is a network of interconnections that exceed human relationships, right? It connects to land, it connects to food, it connects to distribution. It also is, it is intensely political, activist, resistance-based, uh, resurgent, and so I'm, those are the kinds of relationships that I'm referring to. And I'm, I'm hoping that you can, if I explain it clearly enough, each of you can speak to how those relationships can um, describe where we find ourselves today, how those relationships can um, give us a sense of, of belonging, um, but also what their impacts may be for the future. And you can speak to each of your practices. Who wants to go first? I can start. Yeah. Um, you know, when I think about, um, when I think about all of the work that we're creating and we're thinking about um, asserting control over our own narrative, really, I feel like that's, it pretty much like sums up the the exhibition and and I, I'm gonna quote something that um, I often live by uh, my friend Steve Loft had said to me um, or sorry had said not to me but um, he says when members of a community assert control over their own lives and culture politically socially and artistically they go beyond oppression thus control of our own image becomes not only an act of subversion but of resistance and ultimately liberation. And so when I create my work, 
I'm often thinking about the people that came before me because uh, I've been told by uh, some people that, you know, we are the generation that past generations thought of, dreamt about. And so I think about the people who came before me and how they dreamt of us living this present time and how it's important, it's our responsibility to think about that legacy, but not only just think about living in the moment and doing the best that we can and encouraging our community to rise up, but also to create our own narrative. But we also have to think about like thinking to the future because now we have to think seven generations ahead and create, start creating the pathways for that future generation so that they can move us in a good way to the future. And um, I feel like art is, it's, it's a great segue. Um, it's a great form of communication, um, but it's also something that, uh, from what I understand, that everyone did. It was a necessity, it was an important part of their identity and who they were. And you couldn't, um, you had to create beautiful things, you had to create beautiful objects, you had to create art so that you could communicate to the ancestors and the spirits. So um, I, I'm a big advocate for using art and guiding us in a good way towards a better future. Mostly, do you wanna jump in? Sure, I can try. That was really beautiful what you said, Casey. Um, and Rochelle, this is such a hard question. <laughs> Um, it's a huge one. It's a huge one. And I don't think I would have the answer at all right now per se. But for me, what the importance of these relationships, I don't even know where to start. And I think maybe that's fine. I think sometimes you just have to be with those relationships and those things will kind of come in and out of um kind of come out of themselves in a, in a way um so for me throughout this entire process like this entire journey of curating this show i feel as though i haven't fully processed it and i feel as though i still don't fully understand the importance and the significance of the relationships that were developed you know i just know that something's happening and something's changing and i think it's kind of just expanding the way in which i think about things i think it's just expanding the way in which i can imagine what it looks like to, to even imagine the colonial futures, right? And, you know, I mentioned this already about Cheyenne's work, but I feel as, her, as though her work is very much rooted in that. I feel as though, again, I can talk about the dinner for, for forever because I think that just gave me a glimpse into something so beautiful that was very politically important as well, right? Like coming together, not necessarily to talk about deaths within our communities, which is what we hear about all the time. And oftentimes, like when I first saw Black and Indigenous alliances, it was that vigils, vigils from Michael Brown, vigils for so many uh, African American men in the States mainly who had passed away. And that's when I would see those allegiances, right? Those alliances. And the reality, the reality is that we can come together just to be together. And there's something so beautiful about that. And I think it's again, going back to the ways in which divide and conquer have been used to, to, to separate us. Um, and to make sure that we can't imagine futures like this, right? So I don't know how to speak to it because I think we're creating it. And I think, you know, it is something that our ancestors could only have dreamed of, you know? And for me, there's one thing that like, personally, I've gotten out of these relationships and these are part, in part because of the relationships I developed through my job was through indigenous women in particular, I was able to start to understand indigenous worldviews. And learning about things like the seven generation principle, understanding that we don't need to stick to this Western ideology or these Western ways of thinking made me realize that I'm indigenous to my own land and I don't know anything about it. I don't know our cosmologies. I don't know the ways in which we approach things. And I've lost all of that. And I think that what we have here is all that's possible and it's not. So I'm in the process of unlearning and learning new things. So I don't have an answer because I'm kind of just like going with the flow and trying to uh, just be open to new experiences. But I think that's the beauty of it. Thank you so much for that, Casey. 
Um, I think I think that's where like blood memory can be very very helpful. Um, a lot of people don't really understand it or tap into it. Um, we know it exists, and scientists have now said that it exists. But it's it's kind of I always say this analogy that it's um, monarch butterflies never meet their parents, and they know exactly where to go down south, and they travel you know hundreds of kilometers to to go to a foreign land they've never been to before. So that is called blood memory. And so within ourselves, we are one of the most sophisticated organisms on this planet right now. And to say that we don't have blood memory, I think is ridiculous. So I think it's important as individuals that we start understanding and accepting that we have the knowledge within ourselves. And it's just really a matter of bringing it out and tapping into it. That reminds me of the Inuit namesake tradition. Um, when, when someone passes and um, a new person in the family is born, like my son being named after uh, my uncle who passed, uh, Palusi, um, they, with the blood memory that you're talking about, Casey Adams, um, his spirit, his characteristics, his personality is, is transferred and the knowledge from everyone before um, continues on um, and like, like a cycle <laughs> and um, your, the blood memories, it, I think it's transferable to um, all, all of our cultures in, in, in one way or another and how we integrate it in, into our lives and everything. So I just, sorry, I just had to add that. No, oh, thank you. That's great. It's, it's, it is a, it's not a fair question. Just out the gate. That was a, that was a, that was a, kind of a brain fart on my part, but all of your answers. Oh, sorry. May, may I also just say with the question, um, I'm going to pull up, um, Kosi, your, uh, your quote, it, it often speaks to me when you said that black and indigenous women are more than just the seeds that history has tried to bury. They represent deep roots and a harvest more plentiful than we can ever imagine. I really wanted to add that in, into uh, Rochelle's uh, question because I, I do think that with, with all of our um, similarities and we, we have a lot of differences, we, we were all tried to be buried but here we are and it, everything is everything that we're doing now everything that our communities are doing every little step further towards a better future for all of us gives me a lot of hope and I love all of these conversations and I love everything that we're all contributing and putting out there and being able to be vulnerable, to be seen, to be heard, to be acknowledged. I, I just definitely wanted to add that part. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. That was, that, yeah, Cozy, that quote from, from the, the panel, from the exhibition was incredible. And, and it does, it does, there are, there are so many different elements that each of your artworks bring into this dialogue uh, uh, that is relational, um, that is that is connected to uh, other than human relations, uh, kinships, ancestors, and the land. And another way to, to frame the, the question could be, um, when we're thinking about relationships between the food, the land, and the people, um, and this question is for Cheyenne as, is now, because Cheyenne hasn't had a chance to talk about this yet, is uh, do you find in your practice, Cheyenne, that, that the way that you connect food, land, and human beings in an urban context, how does it inform your perception of uh, the politicization of, of food and land, territoriality, identity, boundaries and water for example does that make sense like how do you perceive that in, a, in our current political context and then what might that look like for you going forward 
Yeah, so how I perceive the relationship between all three, food and land, and myself. Okay. Um, the political context. Uh, I would say that, like, um, growing up, I didn't have any relationship to food and land. Um, a lot of, like, my family history is I can't uh, find. So it was just really going off of what I felt like when I started to grow food. And I really went off of... Um, stories of people who look like me and stories of people who fought for liberation on land and food who I felt a similar relationship to. So I would say that um, the very interesting thing for me was that despite me not knowing or being able to find a lot about my like lineage, um, the really beautiful thing I always remembered and I always said to myself was everyone at one time in the world had an agrarian past. So that doesn't mean growing food to sell it. That simply means growing food to sustain your, yourself and your community. So despite me not having footings, and these footings were washed away due to colonialism, um, I still had an understanding that what I was doing was something that at one time an ancestor of mine did. So even though I couldn't find a direct relationship between food and land in terms of looking at a book and seeing this was my great-great-grandfather, um, I knew that some somewhere, a while ago, my great great grandfather grew food as well. So I felt like that was a piece that really wanted me to be a farmer because I, in any other career, I wouldn't feel the same tie. I wouldn't feel the same like kinship because I, I would know that maybe my great great grandfather wasn't an astrophysicist, <laughs> uh, but at one point they grew corn. So I feel like that's the part that really ties it together and it's the un unbreakable bond, I think. Uh, which is really beautiful, the unbreakable bond of no matter what, I know that I'll have that peace. And no matter what, I know that for any liberation to ever take place, food and land have to be there because that's, these are the things that sustain communities. And that's very important. So I would say that's the political piece that I found. And, and knowing that, and, you know, as I get older, um, getting more used to that and also getting more used to knowing that it's okay that maybe I'm not as well aware of my lineage, but I am well aware of now I have a deep relationship with the land, one that can never be replaced and one that will always grow, uh, which is really beautiful. And I feel like my piece was kind of like that. Uh, my piece was about relationships and the symbiotic relationships and also the relationships that you don't see. And that's why I included compost instead of potting soil because I wanted the fungi and the bacteria that they have their own relationship with the plant and you can't see it, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So that's also in a way um, with the spirit world and in a way with ancestors that you don't maybe see, but they exist. Um, the compost in my eyes and that piece had that relationship. So that's a, that, thanks, that's amazing. And it's amazing because you, when you're talking about the things that aren't seen, um, I've been thinking a lot about this exhibition for a couple of reasons. One, I wasn't able to make it to the dinner and I've been thinking a lot about it ever since then um, because I regret it. And uh, two, I'm thinking a lot about it because, because of the number and the complexity of interrelationships and intersections of uh, tangible and intangible um, elements that we take for granted, like, I have a bag of almonds on my table. I don't know where they came from, California, I assume, but they nourish me and I have no connection to their source. However, I am connected to each of you right now. And so when I'm thinking about that in this exhibition, the human relationships that each of you have referred to, either because you were the one that is connecting us to the land or because you're connected to each other or just because we're having this conversation online. Ironically, we're not together, but we're still connected. Um, it's, it's incredibly fascinating how, when you start to become aware of the seen and the unseen working together, it's a really interesting thing that happens, and it's been happening as I've been talking to Kosi and the artists about the show. It, it blows open. So all of the comments thus far have have gestured to things that are, are, are imperceptible, but rather felt emotionally uh, or spiritually. Um, and I, I'm curious to know if, um, 
Catherine, if you can talk a bit about the energy at the dinner, uh, about the, about the people in the space together, and then maybe Kosi can can join in and, and you can talk about that energy because I think that energy is a thread that lives throughout this exhibition and, and ultimately comes right down to the core of what I value about the exhibition overall. Hi, um, I'm unmuted. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to say that it, it was um, it was extremely fluid. I, I was almost like a fly on a wall because I was jumping from one corner to the next. Um, I wasn't particularly in one um, conversation, but overhearing everyone come together. And all I remember is the feeling about, about the room when I, when I was bouncing around taking images of everything was that when I think back and look um, to my memory about, about what was going on, there was a lot of connection. There was a lot of laughs. There was a lot of agreeance. There was, there was the space. Everyone gave each other space to talk and then to be listened to. It, it, everyone had their moment um, and it wasn't rushed. It, it was, it was, it was very intimate and everyone did care so much. And, and then you can just feel that in the entire room the, the, the whole time. It, it was, it was kind of magical. I'm getting goosebumps a little, um, remembering it because I would, I would bounce to one side of this long table filled with beautiful women in two spirit. And they were, they were, sharing food, passing food, talking about their histories, their realities, and, and everyone was so respectful and, and honest and vulnerable, and, and you could really feel that everywhere. The intimacy was, was there, and it was, it was special. It was a very special night. <laughs> So I can I can provide a little bit more context because I feel as though like Catherine and I know exactly what that night was like. And I think that was done in part on purpose, to be totally honest. Um, that night was a private night for Black and Indigenous women and Two-Spirit people. And what we wanted to show as part of the exhibition was just a glimpse into what it was. So when we talk about a feeling, it's just, it was exactly that. It was a really, really beautiful night. Um, so just additional context. So that was the first piece of public programming for the exhibition. Um, so this would be the second, I think. <laughs> um, and it actually happened before the exhibition actually opened. So it happened on November 29th. And it was a dinner that was just closed to Black and Indigenous women and Two-Spirit people. I think we were between like 14 and 20. I don't remember how many exactly. A lot of it was uh, people that I knew um, from my job, from just like friends and so on. And then some people that I didn't know that were also invited uh, to be part of that dinner. And again, going back to the origins of the exhibition, it was again from that feeling of not knowing, uh, not truly really knowing Indigenous peoples when I would go into their communities and feeling like an intruder and feeling like I wasn't actually doing more than lip service because I was, I didn't understand what, what the relationship was between us or we didn't really have the relationship that I wanted and that I felt would be truly that of an ally. So because of that, I felt as though I had to organize this dinner and Carlton was so generous in helping to organize and hiring two co-facilitators. Um, but I felt as though I had to re-envision the kinds of relationships that could be possible. I needed to have a moment where I could have dinner with Indigenous women and two-spirit people and feel as though there was kinship. Feel as though I could get to know them on a personal level, get to know them as people and really start to like share myself and have them share themselves with me. And I knew that I had to build towards that. Um, so it had to be a space that felt comfortable. And I had to, I had to actually, um, initially there was a possibility of me kind of facilitating the dinner. And I knew that I couldn't do that. I knew that coming from government, I still had that mentality. And I feel as though it's, it's very extractive at times. And I didn't want to then perpetuate that within that setting. So 
So I felt as though I had to put myself in position as someone who's unlearning and learning new ways of engaging. So we hired two co-facilitators, one Muna Mohammed, who's a black woman, and then Nicole Paplinski, who's a two-spirit uh, indigenous person. And they worked together to kind of like set out their vision for what the dinner should be like. And they were the ones that decided to do a sharing circle. Um, we started off with Bernard McGregor, who's an elder, who started with an opening prayer. Um, and then from there, she kind of just invited everyone to share a bit about themselves. And like Catherine mentioned, every person that had that feather in their hand, even though they were just prodded to share a bit about themselves, they shared so much. And there was just this outpour of like a desire to be heard and to be seen. And each person just shared and shared and shared and we all held space, space for each other. And I think there was a lot of vulnerability. There was a lot of honesty and there was a feeling that, you know, you could be held in that space, that you would be listened to and that people would be there to not only hold you in the moments of pain when you're sharing things that are difficult for you, but laugh with you at dinner. You know, and that's exactly what happened. Um, so when we talk about that kind of intimate energy, it was exactly that. And we wanted to preserve that for ourselves. So there's no video, there's no audio, no one can overhear what was said. And um, that's in part because of, of other experiences that I've had, where I feel as though sometimes schools coming together, those moments of coming together are done in a way that's voyeuristic for the pleasure of other people. And I wanted this to be for us. And that's why you have the photos, but those memories are ours and ours alone. Yeah, that sounds amazing. It's, not, it's interesting too, because uh, we've, we're, we've talked a lot about creating community. And what's interesting is that the, the notion that creating community requires safety to a certain extent. Um, and I think that's important to note. And again, it goes back to drawing attention to the things that are seen and unseen felt and unfelt or are imperceivable. Um, when, when we begin to think about what art can do, um, what constitutes art, what is art, what, what makes something art, and then intentionality of you know, investing your life's work in growing something and building something. All of you are makers. You're all growers. You know, it's amazing. Um, I want to shift a little bit to talk about the opening. I have a path that I'm kind of wandering down. I'm totally prepared to get off that path, but I have a path. So I wanted to ask about the opening. Um, and, and Casey, if you want to talk a little bit about what, if, these may sound like your main questions, but if, if I'm curious. What did you think when you saw, when you first walked into the gallery and saw all the works together in the space? Like, what was your first reaction? Well, I have to say that I, I came in uh, ahead of time to what, when the works were still being installed. And uh, the reason being is that I had to construct all of these clay vessels using the techniques that I had been learning. And um, what was really great was that I was given all these volunteers to come in and help me. And uh, we sat on the floor and it was really, it was about, it felt like this wonderful little community and we all worked together and we laughed and we shared stories and we just worked on the ground right there in the gallery space just making a mess fortunately we had tarps and then and then as each vessel was being created and was like drying we'd put it on a rock and just slowly this little it, it felt like a community because, you know, the vessels represent the body, the, the indigenous body. And so it felt like these little entities were being grown right in front of us. They were, they were presenting itself right in front of us. And so it was a really beautiful experience for myself to also then see the artwork coming up as well. And getting into the space and I like to see an exhibition when it's already hung so that so that I get that immersive experience just like every other gallery goer does they get to be surprised and enlightened and feel the joy or feel the the wonderfulness of, of the, the art that's being created and um, it was really powerful because it feels like the dinner that oh there's the pictures of us making a big mess uh it the the dinner that that's being described 
kind of felt like the opening where like-minded uh, artists coming together, um, seeing themselves as seeds and growing and thriving. That's, that's what it felt like to me. So it, it was very magical. It was, uh, it was an incredible experience. And um, I, I'm just so incredibly grateful that I had that opportunity. And now that the exhibition's over, the vessels are now going back to the land with the exception of some of the people who volunteered um, who are now keeping the vessels. So they have a home. And uh, that's a wonderful shot of, of all of us who uh, were, came to the opening. So I'm very, very, very pleased about the whole thing. I hope that answered the question. I feel like I went on a tangent there. It was great. It was, it was great. Um, Cheyenne, did you want to talk a little bit about how you felt going into that, into the gallery and seeing, seeing your work in dialogue with all the, all the other works? Yeah, so I would say it was a, it was like a lot in a very good way. Um, it was very also interesting seeing how many different types of works um, were very different, but all connected with food. Um, for example, Bushro's piece uh, about the two girls uh, in the sugarcane field, that's, that was a lot connected in a way to my piece, but it also was connected to the piece about cod fishing. Um, because it was about the relationship between bodies on land and food and going into it, like the gallery and seeing it, especially in the opening, um, it was very, I, how do I say it, uh, it was very nice and very interesting to see the interconnection of the, all the pieces. Um, and I would say that a lot of the pieces made me think about the future and also like what do the pieces have in now like what are the relationship to everyone's piece in the current day for example Casey Adams your piece um, spoke about the ongoing colonialism of indigenous people and in their food right and how the western diet is destructive and that's ongoing now as well and then the piece about the cod fishing um, cod is still such a staple in many Caribbean diets and that's still ongoing now so it's very interesting to see the way these pieces have as big stake in the past, but also in the present, and then hopefully in the future in a different way for a lot of the pieces and maybe a different light. Um, I, I think if I'm saying that correctly. So yeah, and it just was very fun because I could do it. Like, it was very like imaginative. Like I would think about um, what are the people who made these pieces? What were their feelings when they're making these pieces? What were their dreams? What were their hopes? What did they hope the piece would turn into? Um, in the end in people's minds. So I think that it was a very beautiful opening because something such as land and food um, has a different pull to everyone else. So everyone who would see be seeing each different piece would have a different feeling toward it or a different relationship toward it. Or maybe they've experienced something in that piece themselves. Um, and then they can imagine what their future would be and maybe the piece could spark that. So I, I, that's what I felt. Um, I felt very moved by it everyone's piece and obviously I felt moved in different ways with everyone's piece. Was it, um, how has the opportunity to, to be in the space with the artists, with everybody during the opening and the audience and stuff, how, how has that transitioned, if it has, or it maybe influenced how you think about, um, you know, your farming practice, community, um, and ancestry in general, has it? Yeah, I think the biggest piece I pulled away that influences me today is all of those pieces coexisted in the same space and all those pieces had their own space uh, to coexist. Um, and I think that piece really made me think about collaboration and cooperation and how they all were a piece in the puzzle of that curation. Um, not to get too, ooh, but uh, that's kind of what I was feeling. Um, and in my work today, um, I think a lot of what my work today is also about doing work regarding creating my own futures. And I do think that a lot of the pieces I saw um, 
meant a lot to me because people were telling their own history. They had their own space. They're making their own piece. Um, and it was theirs and it was their history to tell. And I think that was really beautiful. So I feel like I carried it over to my own farming practice um, by ensuring that I tell my own history and tell my own story with my farm and how I run it, but also that I work in collaboration and cooperation with people who are already doing the work and who have been doing the work on the land. Um, like for example, in one of the youth gardens I, I run, I save tobacco seed and I save kale seed, I save all these different seeds and I give them away to people that I work in collaboration with and then they grow them next year and then they save the seed and they give it to me. And I feel like that that is really beautiful and that interconnection works and sometimes they grow seed that I don't even grow. Um, and then, but then I get that because they chose to do that. And, um, but yeah, I hope I answered that question. <laughs> Yeah, you answered it amazingly. Thank you. And and again, there's so much stuff. <laughs> there's so much. It's uh, it's very very rich. Um, one of the things that uh, I want to start to to turn towards. Um, so I was asking those last couple of questions because um, I find it incredibly important as a as a curator and scholar with uh, mixed ancestry that who honors both and and moves through different communities and my communities cross over as do many. Um, that this is an exhibition of black and indigenous artists working together and sharing a space. Um, and and that the, the exhibition itself really focuses on building these connections. And I'm wondering if each of you can talk a little bit about why does it matter now that black and indigenous women are sharing this particular space? Catherine, do you want to go first? Hi, yeah, um, sure, I would love to. I think um, there was this article I had read, I think it was about two weeks ago, uh, about decolonial love and how it had also mentioned Black and Indigenous and BIPOC coming together in strength of unity, um, how, how um, there, there was this one quote um, the, that a First Nations woman had mentioned that um, a chief had broke one arrow and, and said that um, one arrow alone is easy to break and then held a handful of arrows together and tried to break those and couldn't and how, how even though we have um, a lot of um, unique um, differences, there's a lot of similarity and strength together. Um, and and that, that term decolonial love just stuck in my head. And I, I feel like um, when, when, when you asked that, that was just the first thing that um, came into my mind. And, something about strength and unity <laughs> if that makes sense it absolutely makes total sense thank you uh Kosi, do you want to yeah definitely um so i think one of the things i've been really interested in is going back to the role of the state and kind of like how the state has kind of colored the kinds of relations that have been possible in the past between Black and Indigenous people. And even like looking to, again, how this exhibition came to be, it's because me representing the government meant that I couldn't engage in ways that felt authentic, right? Um, because I just, it just didn't work. So that was again through that lens of the state really preventing me from having that kind of solidarity that was rooted in trust um, because those two things couldn't work together. So part of what I was trying to do with this exhibition and what a lot of the work speak to in very beautiful ways because they're all very incredibly nuanced pieces of work 
um, there's always this undercurrent of how the state has kind of impacted Black and Indigenous peoples differently and how that has at times prevented that kind of unity or has not yet yeah, has prevented it. I think there's also in terms of the way in which history is conveyed back to us, we can't see the ways in which we might have actually been allied and worked together, like that's hidden, right? So that's why like there is that language of a counter archive because I think those things have been hidden intentionally. So how can we in the present kind of create a counter archive but also create new relationships that make them make it visible that we can be together in these ways and then create an archive of those, these moments as well. Um, because I do think again, like even going back to Casey's work and the five white gifts, those were rations of food that were given to indigenous folks as they were being taken off their land and placed onto reserves. I think reconciliation is an acknowledgement of the historic wrongs, right, of historic policies that have led to where we are right now. And I think in order to understand the ways in which we have related um, in, in ways that have been really productive, or maybe we haven't seen that, it is in part because of what the state has done. So again, if you look at Deanna's work, um, African American settlers coming to the prairies, coming to Alberta, the government didn't even want them to come, literally tried to pass legislation to prevent African Americans from coming to Canada because we were never meant to be part of that kind of um, imaginary of, of settlers, right? We weren't part of, was supposed to be part of this imaginary of, of Canadian, of what Canada was meant to be. So even that kind of migration has always been kind of affected by Canadian policies and so on. So I think for me, there's always that interrogation um, even when we're talking about the, the relationships between Black and Indigenous people, always interrogating the state um, and the role of the state and trying to think through futures that see us coming together more collaboratively um, and building different ways of, share, of sharing power, sharing responsibility, like mutual aid and so on. I think that requires a certain level of imagination and thinking outside of certain constraints. Yeah, thank you. Um, Casey, do you want to weigh in? Uh, well, I, I just want to say two things. One is, uh, um, you know, when um, the Black Lives Matter movement came and was building and, and was finally being heard, um, their fight is our fight. And uh, so I think that's important to remember that uh, we share a lot of similarities so i think it's important that we we look at the real picture here is that we're all human beings and that we all need to work together and there needs to be equity and equality happening the other thing that i was thinking about was like let's just host a whole bunch of dinners <laughs> just like from the exhibition i mean i think i would absolutely love being there because i think when you have those kind of situations where you're bringing um strong powerful women together you can get so much accomplished and so many wonderful things can happen and solutions come forward and not to not to um to always exclude the men out there but um you know it's it's just been my experience that it's it's a really wonderful thing and a lot more sort of uh, things like that should need to happen so yes thank you Cheyenne, do you want to share your thoughts on this? Yeah. Um, can you repeat the question, please? You're on mute, by the way. There we go. Um, why does it matter that Indigenous and Black women are together in this exhibition? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it matters for a lot of the same reasons of why the exhibition was created, because we have so many similarities, albeit not all the same and not all the same struggles in the same ways, but a lot of the same overlappings. And I feel like um, we have a lot more similar than we have apart. And I think that piece is very important. And I also think that the collective imagining of a lot of the ideas um, could be from a lot of the same places. Um, and I do think that when, when we're looking at civil rights right now, and we're looking at indigenous land sovereignty right now, we're looking at 
food apartheid in black neighborhoods right now, um, a lot of it comes back to um, not having sovereignty because of a white supremacist colonial system um, that both of our communities face, um, albeit not the same ways, but still face. And I do think what Catherine said about unity is beautiful. And I do think that it's very important, I guess right now, and has always been, to be allies to each other uh, because we are in, in a very similar fight. Um, and in that fight, I feel like um, I have a lot of empathy toward um, the people who I am an ally to. And I feel like, yeah, I think that's why. I think that um, the land is what anchors us. And I think that's my last piece to say. And I feel like the land is what anchors us. And a lot of the justice we'll find is on the land and through finding ourselves on the land. Thank you for that, Cheyenne. Um, that's a really great note, actually, to turn to Q&A. We're almost out of time, but we do have time for a question. Jason, do you have a question for us for the panel? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this question is directed towards Cozy and any uh, artists who choose to answer. It's how do you hope this exhibit speaks to and shape the nature of um, food policy and food and the work of food policy analysts. That's a, a tough one to take me a little bit of time to kind of wrap my head around. I'm still thinking about something I said like five minutes ago. Um, Cheyenne, I'm actually curious if you would have something to say because we've talked a little bit about like food policy because you work at the grassroots level essentially. But I'm wondering if you would have anything to say about how you think this exhibition should shape the way in which we approach, uh, approach food policy. Yeah. Um... What I would say regarding that is that a lot of the pieces, I can say my piece so much, uh, not to discredit me, but a lot of the pieces touched on issues regarding food and land uh, to an extent that these issues are still seen today. Um, and I do think that policy should be driven by those who are most affected. I do, don't think that those who are oppressors should be running anything at all regarding our livelihood and our community and our safety and our wellness. Um, so I do think that art and this exhibit would have very important place in looking at how food policy should be structured and what things and what topics should be talked about and should be really considered. Um, many of the pieces, many of the pieces um, covered issues that face uh, Black and Indigenous people and both um, in food. So I do think that looking at the pieces, digesting the pieces, uh, marveling at the pieces can really help um, understand what issues that both of these communities face. But I truly do think food policy would be most benefited from asking these communities um, and giving them their own sovereignty to make their own decisions about their own food policy. Uh, but that's just what I think. Um, can I, I also... Yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, sorry. I um, I was just going to say that uh, Fiona, can you bring up the image that I sent you? Just moving forward, I know myself personally, um, I think it's important to also understand the context of within the artworks have been um, shown. Uh, we're in a colonial structure. Uh, art is considered art once it goes within the colonial space, the white box, as it were. And what I want people to go forward thinking about and realizing that art exists with, on our bodies, within our bodies. Uh, you'll see a lot of Indigenous designers, a lot of uh, jewelry makers. They're carrying that art on their bodies. And in my case, uh, I have an image here of of um, a couple of my vessels where I brought people together and we cooked moose meat with moose fat, uh, harvested food and cooked it on a fire using one of my vessels, which is the first time I had ever done it. Even though I had been practicing this, the creation of the vessels for a very long time, I never had the opportunity to actually get foods from the land and cook with it. So this was, this was thinking that 
this is can still considered an art piece, but it's no longer in the context of the white square. And we need to reimagine how we look at art and what we think of as art, because in uh, from an indigenous point of view, of course, this is art. Of course, this is an expression, and it's our way of communicating to to uh, past, present, and future. Absolutely, and I think part of the exhibition context does that because the documentation of the dinner, and, and there's all these the networks reach out to the gallery. Um, the living artwork in the uh, of Cheyenne's is is a great indicator that this is a space that that is a construction and needs to be shattered. Um, and there's different ways of doing that. Um, we have to wrap up. Um, thank you all so much. I'm going to let Fiona pop in here. And yeah, may, may I add one very important thing to the question that was asked about policy? Yeah. Um, there's a book called An Army of Problem Solvers um, that I have completely read. I'm also in the federal government. Um, but it's about reconciliation and the solutions economy and how policies directly not helping First Nations um, uh, and other Indigenous communities. Um, and, and it has direct answers to that very question. It's an amazing book. I really want um, everyone should read it. I've, I've said it to my department like a million and a half times. Um, I, I do think that um, if you want real concrete solutions to uh, policy uh, regarding land, um, Indigenous, and the future, that this book is it. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This is great. We should just do another panel on uh, food policy and sovereignty and activism and art. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, I just wanted to um, thank everyone so much. Oh my goodness, uh, to our panelists um, for their ideas and conversations. Um, this uh, panel will be has been recorded, um, and we'll we'll upload it to our, our YouTube. So um, I hope that it can have a real legacy, and um, and it'll be it'll be viewed lots because um, what everyone said here is has been amazing. It's been uh, an honor to hear it. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, I really encourage you to sign up for our e-list um, at cuag.ca or, or follow us on, on good old Instagram and Facebook. Um, and yeah, have a, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs>